Well, good morning. Welcome to Heartland at Home. Thank you for joining us this morning. You know, it's not uh, sub-zero temperatures anymore, but it's still cold and wet, and and it just feels yucky sometimes. But I will say this, it, uh, it's been an awesome week spiritually. I think God's been doing stuff in His body. And I've been praying for you guys and praying that God's been moving in your lives and in your hearts in a, in a special way. So as we're getting ready for this morning's message from the inside out, the book of Romans, uh, and I will tell you that this this um, misunderstood book has a lot of uh, a lot of trap doors where people fall through and and walk away saying I can't understand it. But I'll tell you when the, when you get through this book, it can really have the benefit of setting you free from legalism and just really understanding and, and in a secure way who we are in Christ and who you are in Christ. So I encourage you to stay with it. And uh, Psalms 22, uh, verse 3, I believe it is, says that the Lord inhabits or sits enthroned upon the praises of his people. As you worship, it, it makes God feel like he can He can be at home there. So I encourage you as we get ready to worship with the Heartland Worship Team in Winnemac, to let God sit enthroned upon your praises wherever you're praising from right now. Let's join them in progress. Let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
three, two, three, three. That has been. Praise the Lord. Come on, let me hear you. Praise the Lord. Every day. Every day. That has been. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That every day. Every day. That has been. Praise the Lord. Let me hear you. Praise the Lord. Your love, slave to the darkness, if it was for the cross. You have warned me with your kindness, chased me down when I was alone. Where would I? Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. With your blood, you bought my freedom. Hallelujah for the cross. Hey.
you for the assurance we have in you, Jesus, that by your blood that poured out on the cross that we are saved and we are set free, Jesus. We just want to celebrate that this morning, Jesus. Thank you. But see the assurance Jesus is mine. Oh, what a full taste. Glory to man. Hair of salvation. Purchase of God. Born of his spirit. Washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. This is my.
with us. This is our. This is our song. Praising our Savior all the day long. This is our story. Yes, it is. This is our Sing our Savior all the day long. Lord Jesus, we just praise you right now. We praise you in our storms. We praise you on the mountains and we praise you in the valley, Lord Jesus. Lord, we come before you today with our troubles, our sadness our worries, our fears, our frustrations, Lord Jesus. We bring them to you today. Lord, we pray that whatever we bring here, you're going to take. We know you'll take it if we just leave it here, Lord. I pray that everyone here is going to take what's on their heart, put it at your feet, and know that your blood washes away all of it. Shame, fear, worry, anxiety, depression, sadness we praise you lord we praise you for this day you made for each and every single one of us we praise you for the breath that's in our lungs so we can praise you more so that we can tell the world what you've done for each and every one of us where we came from what you've done in our lives and i pray that anyone here today that's seeking you they find your face They took the chance to come in these doors today, Lord Jesus. I thank you for them and that courage you gave them to walk through the doors. And I know that you're going to show up. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being in this room. Your presence is beautiful. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we all say amen. All right, church, we got a great service today. Turn around, say hello to someone. Welcome someone new. All right, church. We are in our Romans sermon series. It's called Inside Out, and God's changing us from the inside out. Um, We are in week three right now, and um, I got a question for you. Pastor Glenn did this Thursday night, so I think I'm just going to steal it from him. We have good news and we have bad news, right, in our lives. Who likes the good news first? Yeah, look at that. I'm the same. Good news. Couple, only a couple. So apparently everyone else likes bad news first. Yeah, let's get it over with. Let's get it out of here and let's go on to the good news. So um, that is what our opening video is today. Check this out. So there's bad news and good news. Let's do bad news first. You'll think we're starting there to be finished with what's worst, but actually it's because before chorus, there is verse. Before satisfaction, there is thirst. And before forgiven, there is cursed. Said differently, a favor not needed is no favor at all. That's why the suggestion a man needs saving can leave him appalled. Jesus died to save you. From what, he replies. It's better he find out now than after he dies. The bad news, no sugar coating, no watering down, is this. We are lawbreakers, and despite all of our efforts, the case can't be dismissed. The judge is perfect, and he sees our hearts, so we can't plead the fifth. We are guilty on all counts. This is just a short list. Our creator says, do not lie. We only tell small ones. Do not steal, and we don't except that time at the mall once. Do not murder. Hatred for a few burns in our hearts. Have no gods before me. We worship television stars with our thoughts. For this, we are condemned. Our destination is certain. Hell awaits us for falling short of a God who is perfect. This 
is bad news. And now, how sweet the good news is. When we were good as dead, sentenced without hope for parole, God sent a lifeline, a rope for our souls. Jesus Christ, Son of God, took the most humble of roles and died to save his enemies. Our debt paid in full. Now perhaps you've already heard and find yourself unimpressed, but eternal life is offered us in what Jesus did next. Three days in a tomb, his body laid to rest. Then he does the impossible and breathes after death. Resurrection, if you ever heard, is a cause for excitement. So pause, turn from sin, and walk to where everlasting life is. This is good news. Made good because it rescues. Bad news with good news. This is the best news. All right, so there is a lot of truth in that video we just saw right there. Honestly, I could just say a prayer right now and say, hey, you guys got church today. You know, because there is. There's good news and there's bad news in this world. You know, the bad news, we've been seeing. We've been studying the book of Romans, and Paul has, has shown us a lot of bad news here lately. Now, have you ever received bad news and then you get good news right after it? Well, that happened to me this week, Monday, when we had all this snow and ice. Uh, one of the members here at our church, he got a phone call that his father, who was in, in an uh, institute there where they, they take care of him, a nursing home, he got a call that his father's uh, oxygen level was dropping really low, very dangerously low, and they were going to rush him to the hospital in, in Lafayette. And so my friend, you know, we, we prayed about it, and he was getting ready to go to Lafayette. And before he left, though, he got another phone call and said, when we got your dad here, his oxygen levels are absolutely perfect. They're absolutely fine, They're like 99%. And at the, uh, at the facility where he was at, they had tested on his finger. They put a little, little thing on his finger to test his oxygen level. And at the hospital, they put it on your ear. And apparently the ear one is more accurate because his father's hands were so cold, they didn't get an accurate reading. And so that's why he thought his, his oxygen levels were dropping. But we got that bad news. You know, we prayed for his father. We were worried about my friend having to, to drive in that ice and snow, and that horrible weather we had Monday. But then he got the good news that your dad, your dad is fine. He's okay. Well, Paul, we've been studying the book of Romans, and Paul has been just kind of hammering us these, these first two weeks without, with all this bad news, you know. He talked about our, our sins and the weight of our sins. And remember if you, last week we talked about being under that umbrella of God's protection and how if we step outside of that, you know, it it's all falls on us. It is all part of us if we walk outside that umbrella of protection. And, you know, this doesn't matter whether you're, you're Jewish or non-Jewish or Christian or non-Christian, whether you've been in church your whole life or a little bit. We're all fall into every one of us have sinned. Now, I want to go back. I want to give you a little history here. So Paul was writing to the Christians in Rome, and it was a very small group of, of Christians there. They weren't, they weren't a big part of the population. And last week, we talked about Rome kind of being a combination of, of Las Vegas and D.C. together. You had all the sin of, of Las Vegas, and you had all the, the ladder climbing and the, the backstabbing and the backdoor deals of D.C., and it's all rolled into one there. So the Christians were, were seriously outnumbered there. Rome was a very sinful place at that time. So we're going to dive in right now, and we're going we're to hear some good news from Paul. And we're going to be in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to start right there with verse 20. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised with the writing of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. 
For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Man, I want to read that one again. That one hits home to me personally. For we, or for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We'll be coming back to that one. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus. When he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life and shed his blood. This sacrifice shows God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his eyes when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that we have done anything to, ex to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Now, there's a lot of truth in those eight verses right there. I'll be honest with you, as a pastor, we could probably write a whole sermon series on those eight verses right there. So we're just going to we're going to dive right into this right here. So the law is like a mirror. Verse 20 tells us the law simply shows us how sinful we are. So that law is like a mirror. You know, I've got to confess to you guys. I love those little white powdered donuts. You guys know which one I'm talking about. See, some of you are shaking your head. Others are looking at me like, but those little white powder, I'll absolutely love. I'll eat a whole bag when I start eating them if I'm not careful. Well, the problem is when I eat those white donuts, I get that powder. And it's all in my beard. It gets all down on my shirt. Well, I don't see that until I look in the mirror. I'm getting ready to go to a meeting or I'm getting ready to do something. And I look in the mirror, I see this stuff all over my face. Well, the law is the same way. It's a mirror. It shows us the sin in our life. It doesn't correct any of the sin in our life. It just shows us the sin within our life. It shows me that powdered donut there on my chin. The things that we don't realize are right there. And the problem is, most of the time, you know, when we're sinning, we don't even realize it. We're just out doing what feels good to us. And unfortunately, a lot of times the things that feel good to us, they are, they are sin. So, you see... Every single one of us is in need of a Savior. Verse 23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. You know, Paul wants to remind us. He was reminding the Romans then of how sinful they were. You know, it, it, it's no matter what we think or how good we think we are, we still fall short. We still need that Savior in our life. You know, so that puts every one of us on an equal playing field. You know, everybody has sinned. These people sitting over here, they've all sinned, just so you guys know. And this group over here, they've sinned. People sitting down front here, they've sinned. I'll tell you, my grandmother was the kindest, sweetest lady I've ever met in my life. She had a young man that lived in her neighborhood, and he burned her house down. And she loved him as much after that as she did her own grandkids. Sweet lady, just full of grace. But guess what? My grandmother had sin in her life. Your grandmother had sin in her life. And I know some of you are like, whoa, wait a minute. I'll be talking about my grandmother here. So, But uh, we all have sin in our life. We, we are all on an even playing field with that. And it doesn't matter if you grew up in church or if you grew up far away from the Lord. But here's the thing. God is absolutely perfect. He is absolutely, heaven is absolutely perfect. And he wants to spend time with us. But... God can't be around us if we're not perfect. If we want to walk in heaven with him, if we want to spend time with him, we have to be perfect. Well, this created a problem for God. It's strange to say God had a problem. But it created an, an issue. And God had to figure out a way where he could be reconnected with us. So he sent his son Jesus, the perfect lamb, to sacrifice for you and for me. 
so that those sins can be covered, so that we can walk in heaven in perfection with him. See, Jesus came and didn't sin at all. You know, back in the old days, they would slaughter lambs and goats and bulls and oxen to cover their sins. Jesus wanted a way that each and every one of us could be washed as white as snow. We sing that song oftentimes, how that crimson blood washes us white as snow. See, the law that was given to us shows us how sinful we are. God wanted to make a sink where we could wash that sin and remove that sin from our lives. Now, did you know that different religions, they believe forgiveness, <coughs> pardon me, that forgiveness comes from different places? And today, I want, to, I want to discuss four places. We're going to talk about Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and biblical Christianity. So we're going to start off with Hinduism. Now, Hinduism believes that to receive forgiveness, you have to reach a state of enlightenment. You have to, you have to just, this higher knowledge. Well, what happens is, if you don't reach that by the time you die, you get reincarnated. And maybe you were a person now, and you come back as a monkey, or, or maybe you come back as a snake. Who knows? But you, or maybe you come back as another human, but you're reincarnated. And this cycle continues over and over and over again until you reach the point of enlightenment. Now, that, that's Hinduism. Now, Islam believes that you have to, you have to obey the five pillars of Islam. And the way that works is, is your, your good deeds and your bad deeds are weighed out. And when it comes down to it, you want to make sure you had more good deeds than you did bad deeds. Well, can you imagine you're that guy and you're like teetering. You're just perfectly balanced. And right before you pass away, maybe you get mad at somebody or you scream and shout or you get angry. And all of a sudden, the bad side goes kaplump. But the thing is, with, with Islam, you don't know where you're at. You don't know you had that forgiveness until, until you're, you're gone, until it's too late. So now let's talk about Judaism. So Judaism, they believe that you, you talk to God and you ask God to forgive your sins. Okay, that kind of lines up with what we have. But in Judaism, every sin you've ever committed, when you were a little kid and you, you backtalk your mom or your dad, you didn't honor your mother and father, or maybe that time, like you said in the song there, that maybe you stole something. Maybe you told a lie. Maybe you've been an adulterer in your life. Maybe you've been a thief. You've got to remember every one of those sins. Because if you don't remember them, then they're not forgiven. Now, that's completely different from us. Because what we believe as Christians is that Jesus Christ went to that cross. And prior to that, he had lived a sinless life. And he shed his blood on that cross. His blood poured out on that ground. And that blood made each and every one of you and myself, we can be clean. All we have to do is accept that good news that he made that sacrifice for us. Now, you know, I, when I was preparing for this, I thought, you know, I get to that point right there, I ought to just drop the mic and walk off the stage and be like, that's it, I'm done. But, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. There's other things that I want to, I want to cover with you guys. See, there's a Buddhist parable that's very similar to the Christian parable of the prodigal son. Now, in this Buddhist uh, parable, pardon me, and the Christian parable that Jesus taught, there's a son, and he was rebellious, and he went out on his own, did his own thing. But he soon realized the error of his ways. And so he wanted to come back to his father. He wanted to be forgiven and be restored back to his father. And that's where the similarities of the two parables end. Because at that point, in the Buddhist parable, the son's coming back. He wants to get forgiveness from his father. Well, he's told that he has to, he has to do these deeds. He has to do these rituals. He has to do this work. He has to be a slave to his father to receive that forgiveness. He had to work back through it to get back restored where he was at. Well, now, in the parable that Jesus taught, it's totally different. So the prodigal son's returning home, and he wants forgiveness. He wants to be restored to his father. And what happens is the father sees him coming down the road. He sees his son, and he runs out to him, and he throws his arms around him, and he's happy to see him. And I'm sure he was, he was probably crying and just overjoyed to see his son. And he tells his servants, 
Hey, put a robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. I'm sure he looked over at the servant and said, hey, go kill that fatted calf. Go fire up the barbecue because my boy's home. We're having a party tonight, you know, because they were celebrating. And that son was fully restored to the father. He didn't have to, to climb any ladders or do anything like that. No, he was fully restored to his father just by asking for forgiveness. See, really... It's about do and done. Author Lee Strobel wrote one time, he said, other religions are spelt D-O because it's about what you have to do to get to the Father. But in Christianity, it's spelt D-O-N-E because of what Jesus has done for you and I on the cross. The things, the sacrifices that he made. He paid the price that I couldn't afford to pay, that you couldn't afford to pay. This simple gift is offered to us. This simple gift of salvation. This cleansing so we can walk the streets with the Father. And all we have to do is accept it and open it up. You know, if someone gives you a birthday present and you never open it, what good is that present? What good is that present? Same thing with this gift. Father has given you a gift. He wants you to open it. He wants you to use it. So now, I'd like to dive a little bit deeper. There's one more thing I'd like to cover with you guys. And uh, it's about grace. You know, we always hear this, oh, we're saved by grace. But what, what does that really mean? What does that really mean? So the word grace is a Greek word, and it's the Greek word charis. In verse 24, it says, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. Well, now, what, what exactly does grace mean there? You know, we, it's a word that we throw out all the time. Well, grace is, is, is defined as unmerited favor. Okay, well, what does unmerited mean? You know, what, we, we've got all these Christian terms here. What exactly does that mean? Well, it's kind of like if you've ever been at a restaurant and someone picks up your tab anonymously, doesn't tell you, you know, you were unmerited that. You didn't deserve that. You didn't work to earn that. So we're talking about unmerited favor here. You had favor that you didn't have to work to earn. You didn't have to climb to the Father to receive. Well, now let's talk about favor for a minute. What exactly, you know, is favor? Well, really what it is, it's, it's God smiling down upon us. You know, it, it, it's, think about when you were in school. And there was that one kid, you, everybody knew, we all called him the teacher's pet. We knew who he was. You know, that, was that was her favorite right there. But favor, you know, and, and the word charis, it kind of has a more deeper meaning than that. Charis means to, to like lean in, to move in close to. Think about when you, were, when you were younger and you went out on that date with your girlfriend or your boyfriend and you went to the movie theater. Did you sit as far apart as you could? No, you, you kind of leaned in there because you, you liked them. You wanted you want to be close to them. Well, that's what God's doing. God is, is leaning in to each and every one of us. He's reaching down to us. He's, he's stretching his hand out. We don't have to do works. We don't have to do service. We don't have to be a slave to the Father to receive his forgiveness and his grace. You know, works are, are yes, we do works as Christians, but... It's from the inside out. Once you have God inside of you, then you want to do those works. You want to, you want to help that drug addict. You want to help this person who's fallen. You, know, you see a friend of yours who stumbled maybe in his life. And you want to walk over to him. You want to put your arm around him. You say, brother, you know, you fell. But it looks like there's enough left of you to salvage. I'm going to help you up here. And we're going we're to walk this thing out together. And that's what we do. It's from the inside. It's because God is inside of us. And we're doing those outward things. It's not the other way around. We don't do the outward things to get to God. You know, grace is a, is a gift that God has given us to live a godly life. Now, I said earlier that the law was like a mirror. It showed my sin. It showed me that powdered donut on my face. It's a mirror. Charis or grace, that's like a, a sink. 
That's where we're able to go and wash that powdered donut off of us. That's where we're able to go and get forgiveness in our life. It's through the grace of Jesus Christ. You know, God meets us right where we're at in everything. You know, so many times I've had people tell me, well, preacher, I'd love to come to church, but, you know, I got to get better. I got I to gotta change this in my life before I come. Well, guess what? God wants you right where you're at. He knows the things that are going on in your life right now. He doesn't care. If I had to wait myself until I was cleaned up or good enough, I still wouldn't be here today because I can't do it on my own. You know, I have tried many, many times in my life to do it on my own. But it's through God's grace that we're able to, to do these things. You know, I'll be in my truck and I'm going down the road. Somebody will pull out in front of me, and man, I, I'm quick to tell them what a good driver they are. And I'm going to tell you, we've got a lot of good drivers around here, too, just so you guys know. But, you know, immediately I'm convicted of it. Lord, I, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm sorry I got angry and upset. And then I go two blocks down the road, and somebody else pulls out in front of me, and I do the exact same thing again. It's because I, I can't do it on my own. I have to keep asking God to, to show me that grace, help me to get through this. God meets us right where we're at. Don't worry about, I'm, I've got too much powdered donut on my face and on my shirt. I've got too much sin in my life. I've got to get cleaned up before I, before I can come see, be part of the Lord's house. He meets us right where we're at. So, you know, there, there's, there's other things that I want to I wanna go into with you guys. And I, I struggled whether to put this in here or not, to be honest with you, this next slide. We've got to be aware of the Pharisee spirit. Maybe you've heard that before. Verse 27 says, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because of our acquittal is not based on us obeying the law. It is based on faith. Now, maybe you've heard that before. You've got a Pharisee spirit. I actually, Thursday night, I challenged some of the people there. I said, hey, go into work Friday morning and just walk up to somebody and go, you've got a Pharisee spirit. Well, you know, the first thing they're going to do, they're going to even look at you, either look at you like you're crazy and you've lost your mind, or maybe they're going to punch you in the nose. I don't know. So I, I told them, don't, don't, don't go in there and do that. But, you know, what exactly, what exactly is the Pharisee spirit on their life? See, the Pharisees, they were a group of religious leaders who followed the law to the very letter. Everything they did in their life was to the very letter of the law. And so because of this, they thought they were better than everybody else. They were up here because they did everything the law told them. And all of us, the rest of us sinners, we were down here. So they looked down, our no looked down their nose at us for what, for what we were when really they were no better than us. They were no better than any of us. See, when Jesus was in his ministry, his enemy was not the Romans. His enemy was not the unbelievers. Honestly, his enemy were the Pharisees because they thought that they knew the law. They thought that they knew the spirit of the Father. They didn't understand grace at all. You know, we can't be proud of our human efforts. See, Satan is really smart. First off, he'll try to get you down here in this sin. And if he can't get you in that sin, maybe you start having a relationship with the Lord. And then a few years later, you know, wow, I used to be, I used to be a thief or I used to be a liar. I'm not that anymore. I've still got some issues in my life, but you start, we start getting proud and maybe we look down on that person who's still a thief or maybe that person who's a, an addict. We start looking down upon them. That's the Pharisee spirit. We've got to stay humble. If you remember, when you first met the Lord, if you're a Christian, when you first met the Lord, you remember how your life was. And you cried out, Lord, I need you. I can't do this on my own. That's the same humility that we need to keep every day. Because, I, Lord, I, I can't stop telling these drivers what a great driver they are. I need you to help me. I need your help each and every day with that. We're all desperate for God's grace. Now, we want to sometimes go around and look like we've got it all together, but each and every one of us are desperate 
for what he's offering us. This is, this is the good news right here. And if you don't get anything else today, I want you to get this right here. We were, every one of us were sinners. We couldn't do it on our own. We had no chance of a life with the Father until Jesus Christ went to that cross and he shed his blood, sacrificed once and for all for each and every one of us. That gives us the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven with our Father. So how do we apply this to our lives? First off, we're going to embrace the beauty of forgiveness that we've been given. You know, we didn't earn this. We didn't do anything. I didn't work for it. I didn't do these rituals. I didn't do this little dance. I didn't recite these words. This given, this, this grace, this forgiveness is given to us, each and every one of us, free. And then second, we're going to have compassion for those who are still struggling with sin. You know, when we see a brother down there, like I said earlier, and he stumbled, instead of looking down our nose at him, you know, we're going to pick him up. We're going to help him. Said, brother, you know, I'm here to help you. I'm going to help you through this. Somebody help me through it. I'm going to help you through it. We're going to love him through these things. And then we're going to be aware of that Pharisee spirit. Because I'll be honest with you, it can sneak in really quick. You know, you turn around, you look, and you think, oh, look at that. I would never do that. Well, guess what? There was a time when I would have done that. Or you look and say, well, I would never act like that. Or I would never go to that place. Or I would never go to that extreme. There was a time when I would. So we have to be aware of that Pharisee spirit. We have to protect and guard against it all the time. Now at this time, what I'd like to do, I'd like to take a moment and pray. If I could have every head bowed, every eye closed. And we're gonna, we're gonna do a little heart check right now. And we're gonna look at the sin in our life. Sins that maybe we need to bring to Jesus. Things that we haven't told anybody else. We're going to take a moment and we're going to, we're going to bring those things to him. And then we're going, to, we're going to take a look at the Pharisee spirit and see if there's a Pharisee spirit in our life. I pray that you just help us to not have any pride in our heart. And if we do, help us to identify it right here, right now, and make sure that, that uh, we trust your grace to root it out and we, and we humbly submit to that grace. And we thank you, Lord, that you, you sent Jesus as our substitute and that he paid the price for our sins, that he put us in right standing with you. And then you reconciled us through that transaction and that we are now in your family. And I pray that we see ourselves as sons and daughters in your family that can approach the throne of grace boldly in our times of need. And I pray, Lord, that you just help us to understand that and not see ourselves as someone sin conscious, always worried about this sin and that sin, or what if we do that, or what if we do that, or, what, or, or looking back at the past. Help us to keep our hands on the plow and look straight ahead and let Jesus be the author and finish of our faith and let us walk that story he's writing out for our lives. Help us to walk in grace as we walk by faith and not by what we see around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, that's, that's a lot in just a little bit of talking there. Um, we don't, some of the most misunderstood things in the church is things like grace and faith and understanding who we are in Christ. We can understand these things when it comes to salvation, it seems like. Like we think about amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We approach salvation, we understand that we can't save ourselves. The majority of Christians at least got that far, right? It takes Jesus. It takes something outside of ourselves to clean ourselves. And we get saved because we understand that it takes the power, the grace of God to save us. And through, because we understand that, we take action. Our faith is activated and we take action. We, we believe and we take corresponding acts of obedience to get saved. The problem is... After that, we think, okay, we did it that way. Now the formula switches to now we got to work for it. it. It's no different. We still 
access grace by faith, and the work we do is by Him strengthening us through His grace. That pipeline of grace never runs dry. And we act like we get it at certain times, at special moments, special occasions, we can get that pipeline of grace access. But no, it's a day-by-day abiding in Him. And so I don't know who that's for, but I'm just telling you, grace takes away that works mentality. Are there works involved with salvation? Absolutely. We're, we're doing our Father's business, but it's His agenda, and it's Him giving us the strength to do it. We access it through faith. We activate faith, our, is activated in our core when we understand and hear the Word and, and believe it and act accordingly. And then we access grace, which is His enablement to do what He's called us to do, to live as He's called us to live and be pleasing to Him, because without faith it's impossible to please God. Amen? All right. Okay, enough being, I'm getting a little preachy there, but (laughs) it's it's just, it's really a powerful portion of Scripture. Romans can really set us free of a lot of religious and uh, guilty things that just keep us weighed down and block us from God. Um, Okay, so... Uh, thank you again for joining us at Heartland at Home. We're, we're moving forward on some things, and hopefully uh, you guys are getting as excited as I am about it. We had our first podcast with uh, Pastor Heath Hyatt. It was, uh, if you look on the website, it's on there now. And uh, it was just a powerful time where, where he got to talk about some things. And I, I think that any listener, wherever you're at in your walk with God, can get benefit from that. And uh, I love Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so does one brother sharpen accounts another. And that definitely in that conversation, I was sharpened, and I believe you'll be sharpened too. Speaking of podcast, uh, Dr. Herb Hyatt, who is the founder of, of Heartland Church, and he's also happens to be Pastor Heath Hyatt's father, uh, and a man that I uh, respect very greatly. One of those generals in the faith. He is going to be my next guest, and so week after next, be looking for that podcast coming up as well. All right, we'll be starting on February first. We'll have on on Heartland uh, at home uh, homepage. You'll be able to see links to. The study of the book of Ephesians in a month of lunches. And we're going to go through the book of Ephesians every weekday in February. And this will not be an exhaustive study where we go through every single thing we can. First of all, that would be impossible because every time you pass through the Word of God, it's like a diamond where you, you had one facet was shining and then you turned it just slightly and another facet shines. It's got a whole different outlook. That's the Word of God. It never gets old. It never gets mastered. But we're going to go kind of more of a study to get a basic understanding of the concepts, the main concepts in Ephesians. There are plenty of them in the month of February. So uh, it'll be starting on Thursday, February 1st, and then have have a study on Friday, and then it will resume on the following Monday all the way through February 29th this year. So be on the lookout for that, and I hope that you engage in that too. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to it because I believe uh, God's already stirring some some awesome things inside of me about Ephesians that I'm hoping gets uh, gets you excited as well. Coming soon is uh, text devotions. Uh, I I will be putting out uh, just these daily little little text devotions that probably take you less than a minute to read but maybe something to roll around and stir your faith and activate something inside of you. Uh, and then nothing else, just get us oriented, oriented to thinking about God in that part of our day. So be looking for that. Uh, so speaking of texting and email, you can email me directly at mark at heartland.church, or you can text me at 574-549-3680. Uh, I will respond to those if needed. I will pray if there's a prayer request. Uh, please don't ever have, hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, that is why I share that. It's not a, it's not a burden. It's a, it's a privilege. Okay, who is your one? 2024. I'm telling you, 2024. I've heard some people say it's the year of the open door and all these different things. But I will tell you, I don't know if it's a year of, of an open door for everybody, but if you're praying and you're seeking God, every year is that year of open door. But I, I think there's something special about 2024 where God's going to open doors for you in the relationships that you've been 
uh, praying for. And I just, I just tell you, just keep praying for those people. And when the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart to reach out to someone, just be obedient. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to have a master in theology, a doctor of divinity. You just have to understand what the Holy Spirit's saying to you and just act in obedience. That's it. Um, you don't need to know everything about Romans, Rhodes, and this and that. Those are great things to know. What you just, just need to know is if you're spending time with God and being authentic when you reach out to somebody else, they're going to sense the God in you, and that will influence them whether you do anything else in that interaction. Okay, follow us on uh, social media. <laughs> Obviously, our Facebook uh, Heartland at Home webpage would be the first place I would go, and then look for things like Reels on TikTok, and we have Twitter and Instagram. All right, and uh, visit our website, heartland.church. Select Heartland at Home from the church locations menu. You'll get things where you get in there. You'll see our online giving, that connection card that I refer to a lot. Um, that's where the links are for our our podcast and other current upcoming campus events, and uh, go from there. Okay, our, our offering scripture this week is 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. Those those old Corinthians there. You ever have um, some certain people in your life where they're up and down, and there's, there's tops, and then there's valleys, and sometimes they go from one to the other really quick. And no, they're not bipolar. They're just, they're just up and down quick, and, and you know, those are the kind of people who say, yeah, I'm going to be there. And then you're thinking, yeah, we'll see how you feel about it later and, and whether you're really going to be there and life happens. Uh, I get the sense that Paul sometimes felt that way about the Corinthian church. So this, the context of this right here is they had promised a gift. And when there's a group of people coming with Paul, they're supposed to give a gift to help support another church. So Paul says, hey, just so you know, I'm going to send some people ahead of time to make sure that gift's prepared because I've been bragging on you. And I don't want that to be seen in a negative light if you guys have that up and then all of a sudden you're in that, one of those down moments. And then he wanted to encourage them, give them hope and build up their faith by telling them, hey, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And then he went on to say, God loves a cheerful giver. And so that's that's what that context was. And just so you know today, um, there are a lot of us make commitments, and there's ups and downs and this and that. Make sure that when we're giving, it's a way to respond with joy and cheerfulness because it's also giving can become an act of worship. As we release that gift, we can rejoice with God and and for God and to God for all the blessings He's given us. And if God's put it on your heart to give and support Heartland uh, at home, I can tell you that I appreciate it. We've got things that we're doing. We're purchasing equipment for better equipment for podcasting and for the live streams. We've got a lot of stuff. I'm uh, I'm dreaming big. Uh, as long as it's God's dreams, I don't mind doing that. And I, I tell you, you can, you can be part of that. Uh, and hopefully we're outreaching and we're reaching souls. We're helping people to grow in God. We may, and, and our, our, I'd love it too. If we get people who don't know God and start and, and come to God through watching these broadcasts and you can be a part of that. So if you, if you do give, uh, again, you can go on our Heartland Church website and right there's your give online. And just it's just as simple as that. Go through those motions. And I tell you, we do certainly appreciate that. We appreciate you. And I'm going to close us in prayer. And uh, I, just, I just cannot tell you how much I love connecting with you guys and that I sense that spiritually. And every week, it's an honor to, to uh, be able to spend time with you. Lord, I just pray. I pray for anyone at home that is just struggling, hurting, lonely, um, dealing with all those issues at life that uh, everybody else kind of brushes aside, but some people are having those challenging weeks, those challenging days, those challenging moments. I pray that you give them grace and help them to just uh, have peace in that in the moment of those challenges and to grow in you even in times where in the past uh, we've gotten distracted, we've gotten discouraged, and we've just let our 
countenance fall and we just kind of look to the ground instead of doing what we what we're called to do which is to look up to you for our help where our help comes from and, and get grace from you because it's not us it's you that gets us through day by day and i just pray for that special special uh awareness of the grace of god in their lives through this week and how and give them uh just give them clear guidance and direction, Holy Spirit, on how to activate uh, that grace and access that grace through faith, through acts of corresponding acts of obedience when they hear the word of God and uh, speak to them in a very specific way. And Lord, I also just pray uh, for the for the people that you've called to give to this ministry. Pray that you help them to have a cheerful heart about it and to understand that they are sowing seeds into the kingdom of God. And we don't sow, we don't give money to, to get back like we're planting a money tree. We're giving to bless others. And that's the seed we want to see is the seed of the word of God going to people and growing in them. And I pray that you bless them in every way and help us to keep our eyes on you this week. In Jesus' name, pray amen. Well, thanks again for joining us at Heartland at Home, and I hope you have a great week.